uh, welcome back to the session. Um, today we have Mr. Shaw Veli with us. We'll be discussing um, high cycle fatigue and ultrasonic fatigue modeling using unified mechanics theory. I welcome Shaw to continue his presentation. Shaw, are you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. Thank you. So thank, thank you for everyone's particip participation. So today I would like to continue from yesterday's lecture. Today my topic will be the modeling of ultrasonic vibration fatigue life with unified mechanics theory. So let me start my slides. Okay. So this uh, this research is actually a collaboration research between three different groups. Uh, we have uh, me and Professor Bastron at University of Buffalo. Professor Egna, Professor, Professor Lipsky, Dr. Uh, Michael, and uh, Morosik, Morosiki, uh, at Portland, and of course, Dr. Nashad and Professor Rao at uh, in India Institute of Technology. So these uh, four researchers are from Poland. Uh, they are doing a collaboration research with us because uh, they are the only one who have the ultra, actually have the ultrasonic vibration machine. So they are responsible for the experimental research part. So uh, this introduction about the unified mechanics theory I already uh, uh, summarized uh, yesterday, so I will skip this part. So for the ultra sunny vibration fatigue of the metal, the frequency is of course different than conventional tension compression hydraulic, uh, hydraulic uh, machine. We have a frequency around, uh, can, be up, can be up to 20 kHz to 30 kHz. Under this high, uh, under this high frequency, we'll have a frequency effect and high strain rate effect. Have we have to consider in the entropy generation mechanisms? And still, uh, ultrasonic vibration fatigue is essentially another way to uh, produce a many amount of uh, a large amount of cycles in a short time. So it is still a uh, belongs to a high cycle uh, fatigue. So the it means that the yaw stress, of course, have to be low. The uh, the normal nominal stress have to be the real difference. And again, there's no medical passive, de uh, passive deformation. These are the six important micro mechanisms I mentioned yesterday. Uh, we have this configuration entropy, vibration entropy, entropy generation due to a diffusion of atoms, thermal conduction, internal frictions, and microplasticity. So among these three, uh, among these six mechanisms, uh, the, the, the entropy generation due to thermal conduction, due to internal friction and microplasticity actually will be uh, strongly affected by uh, this frequency. Because uh, this one, thermal entropy generation due to thermal conduction, when we have uh, applied the ultrasonic vibration to the samples, uh, the samples will have a larger temperature increment compared to the conventional high cycle fatigue. For example, in a conventional high cycle fatigue, uh, the uh, temperature difference between the center and the edge may uh, at most around uh, 15 to 20, uh, 20 Kelvin. However, in the ultrasonic vibration fatigue, the temperature difference can be go to, goes up to 100 Kelvin uh, to 150 Kelvin. So let's create a larger uh, a temperature gradient. And therefore, the, the thermal conduction and entropy production will also will be therefore larger. The next one, entropy generation due to inter inter internal frictions. Yesterday, I ignored these mechanisms because these mechanisms uh, will not uh, have significant effect in the low frequency range. However, when you talk about the ultrasonic vibration fatigue, some mechanisms like the uh, uh, drag of the phonon, drag of the electron, drag of the radiation, uh, they comes into play in uh, this high cycle uh, condition. And also the dislocation, dislocation relative motion will also cause entropy production. So uh, this one has to be considered in this test scenario. And finally, microplasticity entropy production also, always ha also have some changes because this microplasticity uh, will be affected by the, there will be a frequency effect that, that uh, affect the production of microplasticity. So these three are the mechanisms we have to go over again. 
So before that, I would like to first quickly go over the, uh, the test setup. So this one is our test sample. All the diameters are in millimeters. So you can clearly find that this is actually a very small sample, only about uh, six centimeters. And uh, this, uh, this scale sample is equivalent to the A656 gray scale in the United States Center. And uh, it has a very specific geometry. These geometries have has to be designed in very specific details so that they can uh, create the, uh, uh, the required resonant frequency. The uh, fatigue tests are uh, performed on the ultrasound resonance test machine with a stress ratio of uh, uh, negative one. Of course, the frequency is around 20 kHz. We apply the vibration amplitude of 60 mu m. During the test, we use a thermographic camera to capture the temperature uh, variation. Uh, focusing on the gauge center, because we know uh, the, the temperature increase uh, in this uh, ultrasound vibration fatigue will be many uh, uh, very different than the conventional, uh, conventional high cycle fatigue. So we would like to monitor this temperature, and then we derive uh, another uh, thermomechanical equation. We are trying to compare the uh, simulation data with the uh, actual monitor temperature. So that's the reason we set up a thermographic camera here. So uh, actually we have to do a model analysis to find an element to carry out the frequency, to find the free natural frequency, resonance frequency of the sample in the actual direction. So basically we build, a, uh, build up uh, Abacus FEN software and then perform these steps tension conversion resonance frequency in the actual direction. But we figure out that the frequency is, the resonance frequency is around 20 kHz. It is actually only about uh, 19,000, uh, uh, 1908, uh, this amount of Hertz, very close to 20 kHz. And here you can find the stress distribution and the displacement distribution uh, of the sample. So this, uh, the test is actually, consists of three different uh, parts. So first we have this kind, this, this uh, component called the booster. Booster is used to generate the a vibration amplitude, a displacement amplitude in here. And the ultrasonic en energy is transmitted from this booster to this home all the way to the final sample. So this is our sample. And you can see we have a, a uh, larger stress amplitude here, and the stress amplitude here is of our interest because we are interested in, at uh, we are interested in the stress amplitude at the gauge section. So this one is the distribution of the stress. This one is the distribution uh, of the displacement. So this is a model analysis. We find a uh, final element uh, simulation results. We can find the average stress amplitude around the gauge center. This one is uh, on the surface. This one is the uh, cross-section view. And this one shows the average stress of uh, around six, uh, around uh, 380 megapascal with applying stress amplitude, uh, uh, with applying uh, displacement amplitude about 0 0.018 millimeters. And this one shows you the profile of the stress and the profile of the displacement. And again, this stress amplitude is a stress amplitude at the gauge center, and this value must not exceed, exceed the yielding strength of the material. The yielding strength uh, in the, of the material, I remember, is around uh, 400 megapascals, uh, 400 to 410 uh, megapascals. So the uh, stress amplitude uh, here, we have to control it and cannot let the stress amplitude at the gauge center larger than the yielding strength. So this uh, is uh, uh, the, our ultrasonic ultra resonance testing machine. And this one is our infrared, infrared thermographic camera. Uh, we use a total of 21 samples to determine the fatigue limit. And we use another 15 samples to uh, construct the fatigue SN curve. And among these uh, 15 uh, samples to construct the SN curve, we monitored 11 uh, samples. We used a thermographic camera to monitor 11 samples. 
uh, the temperature are recorded and can be shown in a later picture. So this one is uh, uh, the staircase fatigue data uh, obtained from the uh, obtained from the experiment. They use this so-called uh, up and down method. Is I believe this one is a statistical method to uh, to interpret to uh, interpret the the data. And finally, they using a uh, Dixon formula, another statistical method uh, for the experiment. They find that the fatigue limit is around three hundred and sixty-eight plus and minus 3.3 megapascal. Plus and minus 3.3 is basically just a standard deviation of the fatigue limit. So they determine the fatigue limit by the experiment using this statistical, these two statistical formulas. And finally, this one is the fatigue SN curve for the ultrasound vibration test. Uh, first line is a uh, 95, I believe the 95 degree confidence uh, level and the other one, uh, anyway, and these uh, fatigue data are forced into the confidence, different confidence level. And this one shows the temperature evolution on the surface of the sample using the thermographic camera I showed you before. So this temperature is actually quite important because as you can see, uh, Unlike the conventional high cycle fatigue, conventional high cycle fatigue usually have a initial increase of temperature, and all the way it will keep and maintain as a constant temperature. However, in the also sunny vibration fatigue, uh, it's, uh, we have an initial high temperature increase followed by a, a almost linear uh, a temperature uh, setting temperature increase in, in this part, and finally a uh, tem uh, rapid temperature increase in the final stage. So actually, this temperature uh, evolution can be divide, divided into three different phases. We can say the first rapid increase part is a phase one due to internal frictions. And it is increased very fast because uh, it can be achieved in only uh, several seconds. And that, uh, in those only several seconds, there's not enough time to actually activate uh, uh, this heat, dis heat dissipation. So it, initially, we have very high uh, temperature growth, very rapid temperature growth. And in a phase two, which is this uh, approximately linear stage, we have a steady uh, heat generated due to internal frictions, microplasticities, and we also have a local heat, uh, local heat loss due to the uh, conduction of the heat with the environment. We, so we have heat in this stage, we have a steady increase of temperature. And finally, this part, the uh, Again, this uh, uh, rapid temperature growth part at the final stage is uh, what we call phase three. At this phase three, we have a very rapid temperature increase due to the initiation of micro cracks. So that's the three different phases of the temperature profile during the ultrasound vibration fatigue. And here I'm showing you the temperature distribution on the surface of samples at different phases. This one is at the end, at the end of phase one. These two are uh, middle of phase two, end of phase two. And this final figure is the end of phase three, which is the start of uh, cracking. So actually we can find that even though, uh, even though in the, in the phase, phase two, even though phase two temperature gradient is much, uh, uh, much lesser than the temperature gradient in the phase three, we still have a, a among uh, a, we still have around uh, uh, eighty to one hundred uh, Kelvin uh, temperature difference between the gauge section and the grip section. So the temperature difference is actually already very high for the ultrasonic vibration fatigue, even though it is in the only only in the phase two. So the temperature difference between the gauge section and grip section is already around eighty to one hundred Kelvin. Uh, in the ultrasonic vibration fatigue, it is very large compared to a conventional high cycle fatigue. So that's the experimental part. In later on, we are trying to uh, use the thermomechanical equation, trying to uh, rebuild the temperature simulation data and compare the, our similar temperature simulation data with this experimental curve. And we are also going to use a uh, unified mechanics theory to uh, build, uh, build up an SM curve and compare our SM curve with this experimental data. 
So these are the six entropy generation mechanisms uh, I mentioned yesterday. So these three mechanisms I have already explained, they are actually quite uh, small compared to the other three mechanisms. So these first three are negligible in our case. And these four mechanisms are mechanisms we have to study in this, in this, uh, in this paper. So the entropy will be composed mostly of these, uh, these three mechanisms, thermal conduction, internal heat generation, and microplasticity. So these are configuration entropy, uh, vibration entropy, and the vacancy content concentration, all explained, uh, introduced yesterday. So again, this one will be the entropy generation due to thermal conduction. The value will be higher because the temperature gradient will be uh, higher in the also sunny vibration fatigue than the high cycle fatigue. Now the track mechanism, we have uh, the internal frictions. Uh, we in this case we have to start considering initial internal frictions because uh, in the uh, also sunny vibration fatigue, there's a mechanism called the track process that involves the phonon track, electron track, and radiation track. And we figure out that the, in, uh, the least, oh, in at least frequency, the phonon track is actually the most dominant tracking mechanism among these three. Basically, at a high strength rate, uh, in addition to the dislocate, dislocation to dislocation interactions, we also have at least uh, mechanisms uh, re uh, resulting uh, in a viscose track. This viscose track is due to the interaction with phonons and the dislocated dislocations. So these thermal phonons in a crystal are scattered by these gliding dislocations. When uh, there's a dislocation movement, the phonons will basically uh, provide the impedance force and that heat that will, in this, case, in this case, it will result in a track force and that will lead to the energy dissipation. So the heat, total internal heat generated rho density times the amount of uh, heat generated per a mass during the drag, due to the drag maintenance, drag mechanism is equivalent to the uh, total dislocation density times the uh, times the dislocation track force per unit length times the velocity of the dislocation. And the uh, the, the track force per unit length of the dislocation is equivalent to least drag coefficient b drag again times the velocity of the dislocation. So this, uh, the total density of the dislocation times the uh, force per unit length give us a total force and again force times the velocity gives us the uh, work per, uh, per, uh, per unit time. And one thing we have to be careful, uh, I have to emphasize here is that the dislocation density is actually closely, closely related to the shear strength rate. So this term is actually strength, uh, sh strength rate dependent. So strength rate will affect the, uh, the contribution of this equation. So this term, drag mechanism is strength rate dependent. Another term, the dislocation, dislocation relative motion during the microplastic deformation is given in this term. It, uh, in this term, we also have a shear strength, uh, strength rate term. So combine these two equations, the first drag motion, uh, drag, uh, uh, heat generation due to drag, uh, phonon drag, and the heat generation due to dislocation motion. By combining these two, we find the amount of entropy generation due to the internal heat generation will be this combination of these three terms. And they are strength rate dependent because V is ready to a strength, a shear strength rate, and this one is also ready to shear strength rate. So the shear strength rate, uh, uh, affect this term in a high in a high, also sunny vibration fatigue. We have high strain rate and high frequency, so this equation have to be considered. Finally, uh, the entropy generation due to the microplasticity. Basically, uh, this uh, two scale model uh, I already uh, explained yesterday. We use a loss of localization to find the micro stress and micro strain at the corner of the inclusions. These all uh, calculation mechanisms are the same. The only difference that uh, is that uh, in the ultrasonic vibration fatigue, I have to add a, an additional uh, additional uh, coefficient called the frequency calibration coefficient to our equation. So let's see, uh, let's uh, 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 go over this equation again. So 
this equation have a micro stress uh, tensor product uh, uh, micro plastic strain micro stress uh, times a micro plastic strain that will be the micro plastic work divided by the temperature work divided by temperature that will be the entropy per, time, uh, per unit time times the fv fv is the volume function of the this uh, volume function of the micro defects because we are only accounting for the uh, the micro capacity micro capacity happens at the uh, this happens at the uh, micro defects so we have to times this fv coefficient phi is accounting for the evolution of the micro defects evolves from 0 to 1 so so far it's, it is just the same questions as uh, mentioning as i mentioned yesterday however here i'm adding another coefficient called the vf vf is a frequency coefficient so what uh, what, uh, what this coefficient do is it relates the uh, the frequency frequency effects to the entropy production rate uh, as we know some materials uh, if we give it if we uh, give it the same stress amplitude but operating them at different uh, frequencies. For example, we give, we, are, we give them the same stress amplitude around, for example, 380. However, we are operating them at 20 hertz and 20 k hertz respectively. Uh, there's, there will actually be a, a fatigue life difference between the 20 hertz and 20 k hertz. That's the frequency effect. And this coefficient is used to calibrate that effect, to consider that effect, actually. So this uh, coefficient is used to rate the machine operating frequency with the entropy generation rate. So this, uh, to study this uh, coefficient, we have to look uh, inside the details of the uh, structure of the of our material. So uh, our material is, is basically a ferrite-based uh, structure steel. And for ferrite-based steel and have a, that have a BB, uh, BCC structure, uh, we have a transition between the def uh, deformation fault from this uh, thermal activate, thermal, thermally activated region to uh, a thermal mode at stress amplitude above the fatigue limit. So there's a transition between this region, between these two uh, deformation patterns. And these two deformation patterns actually have different micro mechanisms. For example, at this a thermal mode, which is uh, which is the which is where our ultrasonic vibration belongs to. Uh, at this mode, uh, we have a mobility of this, uh, the mobility of screw and edge discretion will be equivalent, and screw discretion can cause slip. So the micro mechanisms here is a cause of screw dislocations for, uh, for the also sunny vibration fatigue that belongs to this region. So this uh, cross slip of this screw dislocation is actually frequency dependent. It is frequency dependent. As you can see, this one is an equation uh, I uh, obtained during the literature uh, review. I find that there's actually a cross slip probability for the uh, cross slip probability of the cross slip dislocations or cross slip of screw dislocations. Screw dislocations. It is ready to uh, 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 a coefficient, uh, the, the relative length, the duration of the time versus the reference time. Uh, the, uh, the resolved shear stress um, minus the critical shear stress that can activate the cross slip over a Boltzmann constant, absolute temperature, and the volume of the screw dislocation. So this one is a probability, uh, cross slip probability, probability for screw dislocation. And by this probability equation, it can be further derived. We can further derive this equation to obtain the time to duration, time duration, time duration to activate one cross slip. That will be this equation. And the time duration to activate one cross slip is inversely related to the operating frequency of the machine. As you can see here, it is inversely related to the frequency. So now, uh, uh, for example, uh, if we have the same stress amplitude, we give them or give a, a test sample the same stress amplitude, but we are operating them at different frequency range. One is around 30 k hertz, uh, 30 hertz, the other is around 20 k hertz. In order to reach the same cumulative probability of cross slip activation, in order to make their probability the same, the time duration uh, to the uh, time duration to activate the cross slip per cycle times the total amount of cycles 
must be equivalent. The multiplication of this time and the number of uh, cycles must be the same. So we have this uh, uh, equi equivalent equation. So we can uh, do, uh, we can assume uh, we can obtain a approximate ratio between the numbers of uh, operating cycles and the numbers uh, and the frequency operate uh, and the operating frequency. The number of cycles to reach value is actually positive related to the operating frequency of the testing machine. But again, this equation is only applied to the ferrite based uh, metal because for the ferrite based metal, we have this kind of transition uh, mechanisms and we have this kind of school degradation quality. So that is restricted, restricted to that case. So uh, by ob obtaining this uh, uh, positive uh, ratio, we use this fire factor to include the above frequency. The fire factor is uh, basically approximately the conventional operating frequency divided by the ultrasonic vibration frequency that is used to uh, used to include the frequency effect. So everything is the same here, uh, but the only difference is that in the microplasticity model, we add the uh, frequency. Uh, uh, coefficient to our entropy generation equation because under different among the frequencies, uh, the under for example under the ultrasonic vibration for at least twenty kHz, uh, we'll need more time to actually generate the my microplasticity. Yeah, yeah. Uh, sorry to interrupt you. Uh, yeah, can you explain what is cross sleep? Uh, Cross sleep. Uh, I don't have a picture here, but it is the uh, it is two dislocations. They kind of uh, cross it like this. Uh, they have an angle that uh, basically one dislocation is in uh, cross sleep with the other dislocation. This kind of uh, uh, direction. I can show you uh, uh, maybe a picture of the cross sleep uh, after the uh, presentation. So that will be the only difference between our micro, uh, our model, uh, our previous model and the current model. The micro capacities have to include this frequency effect to uh, the micro capacity entropy generation. So then we have this uh, uh, thermodynamic thermodynamic fundamental relation in metal ultrasonic vibration for the layer that will be uh, the specific entropy production of our, in our system. And these three turns are uh, this uh, this turn this turn, and this uh, turn these three turns are the dominant mechanisms. And we can use the specific entropy production implement this one into our TSI equation to calculate the evolution of this index. And uh, similar to the previous lecture, uh, the service of the temperature T must be uh, must be uh, investigated in very in detail in order to precisely obtain the, the entropy production. And that, will, that can be reached by deriving this uh, uh, thermomechanical equation. The thermomechanical equation is again derived from a traditional Uh, uh, is, is derived from conventional uh, thermo, uh, continuum thermomechanics, uh, continuum thermo, thermodynamics. And we are replacing the plastic work by the microplastic work. And we are also uh, introducing the introducing the internal heat generation from the, we are also introducing the inter, internal heat generation from the dislocation and the uh, drag mechanisms here. We include the heat generated from the internal frictions into our equation. So this equation will be uh, the thermomechanical equation that can help us to simulate the temperature. And we can discretalize this equation to find the uh, time integration form for the temperature. And we can also find the temperature increase per cycle. So this, uh, this temperature equation is used to help us to uh, Help us to uh, find the temperature inside this entropy generation equation.
So these are material parameters for the, the for the material. These are material parameters for the dislocation motions. And finally, uh, we have the entropy generation versus uh, the amount of cycles. And here at this time, I'm showing you all the stress amplitude versus the uh, all the all the entropy production uh, from different stress amplitude. We all have all, uh, we have around one, two, three, four, five, six. We are around seven different uh, sets of data. We are all running in and and trying to test their frequency, and they at the failure at the failure they all created the same amount same amount of accumulated uh, entropy. This entropy again is called the fatigue fracture entropy and the fatigue fracture entropy is depending on the material not the geometry not the test frequency or not the uh, loading type it is related to material so the fatigue fracture entropy for this material is around uh, 4.1 and finally we have the temperature and TSI evolution so these uh, curves that have that have, have the arrow that have the have the error is the uh, experimental obtained uh, uh, temperature, and these data, these data, these lines are the temperature are the uh, simulated temperature. So we can see that actually a simulated simulated temperature can match the experimental data uh, in stage one in phase one quite well. A little bit difference in the phase two. And it cannot uh, capture the phase three because in our thermomechanical equation we are not including the evolution of the cracks. So of course our, our thermomechanical equation cannot simulate the phase three. But because phase three also includes very uh, a lot of instabilities, so it is very hard to simulate this part. But since this part only contributes a very small amount of fatigue life, so it is okay to ignore the phase three temperature evolution in the thermomechanical equation. And finally, this one will be uh, the uh, thermodynamic state index evolution from zero to this given number. So we can use the stress amplitude versus the number of cycles to reach failure to again produce, reproduce an SN curve. And this time we can see our SN curve in this line. And it is forced in the in this confidence level. So that will be uh, uh, the how to use a uh, uh, unified mechanics to model ultrasonic vibration fatigue of a material. So the conclusion will be uh, uh, we are we are again we derive the thermal uh, uh, thermal thermodynamic thermodynamic fundamental equation and use the some thermodynamic fundamental equation to implement to our uh, thermodynamic index to calculate the uh, air fatigue type. However, the only difference between the high cycle fatigue and ultrasonic vibration fatigue is we have to consider the frequency effect when uh, the in the generation of microplasticity. And we the frequency effect and the hydrogen rate effect were also uh, causing the heat generation from internal friction. These two are main factors that will uh, basically uh, change the fatigue life between these two different tests. So thank you for your listening. Thank you, Xiao. Now I will request the participants to ask questions if they have. Can I ask a question, uh, Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it's a very good presentation. Um, I just want to know that the temperature we are probing on the specimen so this is related to the temperature on the specimen. You mean? Uh... Uh, yeah. So what I want to know is. Uh... You mean a material yes. constant? Uh, oh, no. yeah. No temperature. Oh, okay. Temperature. Oh, uh, yeah. Very, yeah, this, this, this is fine. Yeah. This slide is fine. No, yeah. no, the where you are measuring the temperature that what your figure you have shown now, no? Temperature distribution of the specimen as a function of number of cycles. Oh, this one? This number of cycles? Uh, yes, yes, yes. So yes. here, uh, because the test is done in open atmosphere, right? Uh, 
the, the it is an ambient environment open air correct because the environment is not uh, uh, that means there is a uh, it's not a adiabatic type of uh, what i mean to say is that the actual temperature that can gen that may be generated may be higher than what is measured because of dissipation is it i want to know whether it can can be higher than what is measured here because of dissipation to the surroundings uh, the temperature mm -hmm. what we measure on the specimen may be lower than what is actually generated or no i just want to know that okay my i will put it again yeah. Uh, yeah. this is a, this is a temperature measured by the the measured temperature Camera. yes yes but during deformation because of heat dissipation to the surroundings yes the actual actual temperature may be higher than this or no mm. i think uh, i think in the, during the during the testing uh, I, I, I believe that during the testing they are actually monitor the temperature by this uh, this machine right so this yeah. machine they they monitor the oh okay so i, I see your question uh, this is after the heat dissipation we are measuring right there is also a parallel heat dissipation is going on to the surrounding yes. Surrounding, so, so the temperature will be higher than what we measured, right? Uh, but but I believe the temperature they measured is the instantaneous temperature they observe from the, at the gate section. Okay. Okay. So that's this instantaneous temperature. For example, it is consistent consistently under a psychic loading, and they are consistently using this camera to monitor. The instantaneous temperature change, uh, change at this center during the entire testing. So they are not, are not uh, they are not allowing to the these samples to have a cool down period. This is a continuous. I believe this is a continuous uh, process. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So fine. So then, uh, uh, do you know the frequency? Say, for example, if you consider two slip planes, okay. Uh, mm -hmm. Each slip plane is having one dislocation, like a slip plane one and parallel to that another slip plane. Okay, so there are mm -hmm. two dislocations on the two slip planes. So uh, because of very high frequency, it is possible that they may not see the presence of each other. Like one dislocation is approaching another dislocation, yeah. but they don't feel the interaction because the frequency is very high. So yes. they may see only the lattice uh, drag, that is lattice vibrations will cause the drag for the dislocation movement. So what is the cutoff frequency usually uh, where the dislocation doesn't feel the effect of another dislocation? Did you consider that? Is, is it because the frequency is very high? We are in the viscous drag region, I feel. Oh, you mean uh, the frequency that will actually activate uh, yeah. the frequency? The the oh. frequency when the dislocation uh, there are two dislocations so but yeah. they will not see each other because the frequency is very high but yeah. they may see the lattice vibrational drag so or there will be some cutoff frequency between these two that means uh, below certain frequency yeah uh, lattice drag will be there plus a dislocation and dislocation uh, interaction will be there but above certain frequency uh, only phonon drag will prevail so oh. That is thing is there on this. Uh, maybe it may not be there in the frequency. What yeah. you said, very high frequency, it may be there. Okay. So then the second, then another question is this: uh, yeah. uh, What do you expect the cracks where it will form? You feel that PSB uh, persistent slip bands play a role, or uh, uh, because PSBs will form on the surface, correct? Yes. Whereas uh, near the inclusions, uh, PSBs may not be there. Yes, yeah, so I mean you you mean a PSP is in, uh, in uh, extrusions on the surface. Uh, yes, uh, yes. I, yeah. yeah. Yes, it may be there, but uh, when we are doing it very high frequency, you also observe yeah. PSBs on your specimen. Uh, it will be there. No. Uh, the I believe it may not be shown on the surface of samples because. Uh, uh, according to the transition, uh, this uh, in a, also a very high cycle predict sometimes the, uh, the value is from the intrusion induced value, so we may not see the extrusion of the sequence on the surface. Yes, yes. so you, your your material is failing by inclusion induced failure, right? Uh, yeah. Right. Okay.
Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hello, Lee. Uh, I have yeah. a query. Thanks for uh, continuing the yesterday's nice lectures. Yeah. Now I am gaining more insight in this uh, UMT uh, model. Uh, just I was thinking that the you have proposed the the at least I think five six uh, uh, the entropy is a source of they contribute in the field. Yes. So which one is most significant? Is there any order sequence or uh, ascending or descending order? One can say that the, this particular uh, factor has more contribution in failure. You have done that type of. Oh, you mean the comparison between different mechanisms to see which one have the larger. Yeah, the different mechanisms yeah. which you have just yeah. explained. Yes, yeah. yeah, so, so actually uh, the contribution here will be. Uh, let me see. So these two are uh, basically in the. Uh, it can be natural, but one is the configuration, the other is the vibration, and this diffusion mechanism can also be ignored. So these three will actually control the total entropy production. But uh, among these three, among these three equations, I believe the internal frictions and the uh, microplasticity will be higher than the entropy production of the neutral conduction. So these right. two will be, yeah. So this, if you want to use the model, then we can simplify our equation to just include this one, this one, and this one. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Singh. Any more questions? I think I should uh, call by name. Mahendra, you were asking one question about cross learning. Actually, he answered. Uh, the, yeah, answer. Uh, in the middle of the presentation, he, the question was uh, answered. Okay, fine. I have a small query. Uh, how do you subject the specimens to ultra? Uh, ultra high frequency vibration. So, is okay, there so, a machine you have for that? Or? So, we basically, at least, is our machine, right? So, we are generating the actual resonance. Actually, we apply the actual uh, displacement in, the, in this actual direction. So, there's a displacement in this direction, and this it lets the specimen to vibrate at its resonant frequency. So, there's actually the samples here. The samples I show you here, uh, or, or although they already have a given uh, given dimensions, but actually these samples have has have to be designed in very uh, specific details to allow, allow it has a uh, resonant frequency around twenty kHz. Then we apply the uh, actual the actual amplitude in this direction to vibrate the samples. Try to reach its resonant frequency. When it reaches resonant frequency, then it will be vibrated in twenty kHz. And we can see the stress distribution and the displacement, uh, stress amplitude and displacement amplitude, amplitude when we actually vibrate the samples at that frequency. So the machine can vibrate at that frequency. That's... Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Brahmanathan, are you speaking? Yeah. Your voice is feeble, not clearly audible. You can write in chat box, I suggest. Yeah. Uh, meanwhile, I want to convey one information. Uh, people are joined. So all the people who are joined uh, through AICT, we have, we have sent you an email regarding the confirmation of your details. Please acknowledge that so that we can prepare your certificates. Those who have joined through ISAM, we will uh, prepare your certificate separately. Uh, but for AICT, the certificate should be issued by the Center of Continuing Education, IIT Madras. For that, you have to verify your details. So the mail has been sent today. 
please verify that i acknowledge that and then we can start preparing your certificates thank you thank you ashish hey so any more questions hello 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 can you hear me now yes yes actually you mentioned that six uh, entropy generation mechanism is that yes. limited to this particular material or is it common for uh, same oh, kind methodic. of yes uh, in the equation here uh, let me see yes and this thermal conduction equation is for uh, uh, is for uh, all the model material uh, applies for all different materials but we have of course we have to change the uh conductive co coefficient this one applies to all the uh, materials because it, it is about the permutation of atomic different size this one also applies for all materials but uh, i believe the only difference uh the biggest difference here is the uh generation of uh micro plasticity uh because here we are adding the frequency coefficients to our equation and that may may not be true for all different metals for, for example if you are uh, metal is a Martin, a Martin set, a Martin set based uh, metal. Then it will not have a significant frequency effect. It means that when you apply it, uh, for example, 20, 20 hertz and 20 k hertz, the, free, the fatigue line will be approximately the same. But for some materials, there was a, there will be subject to the frequency effect. So that will depends on this equation. This V F factor is actually depending on different kinds of material. material. But the rest of the equation, I believe it is, uh, it can be applied to all metallic materials. So if we consider a different range of uh, frequency, so this again, this six uh, mechanisms will come again. Yeah. So only, only for some specific materials, we have to consider frequency effect and for some materials, so we don't because uh, their micro mechanisms doesn't contribute, uh, doesn't re, uh, result, uh, doesn't have a relation between the, the based on the frequency effect, we are not affect their micro mechanisms. So they, some materials don't have to consider this effect, but some materials have, have to. So that will be a material dependent parameter, this one. And the other uh, sources are basically universal for the metallic material. Uh, Dr. Lee? Yeah. Are you planning to work on Paris law uh, using this methodology we had developed for a sun curve and all? Uh, sorry, for what? Uh, are you planning to work on the Paris law using the methodology you have developed now? So use uh, this methodology to, to do what? Sorry. Paris law. Okay. Paris law. Okay, write in the chat. Thank you. He is talking of Paris law, which is used for crack propagation. Oh, oh. crack. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah. So, so that's that will be an interesting topic. But uh, currently, this uh, this equation cannot be put, uh, used to predict the crack path or crack crack uh, crack or crack propagation because we are not including that, that uh, mechanism in our equation. But yes. Uh, uniform mechanics can be used in many different applications, and I believe that will be a very good topic. Any more questions? Okay, so... Yeah. It's high now, right? Yeah, okay. Then okay. We will stop here. Thank yeah. you, Sean, for this evening, uh, session. And yeah, thank you for everyone's positive participation. Thank you. Yeah, bye bye now. Bye bye. I, I would request Ashish to take over the session. Ashish? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Shao. Thank you, Naushad, for your uh, uh, good session. And uh, now uh, uh, we have over with today's session. Tomorrow, is the last day of this uh, workshop so we will start with the same time five o'clock with the uh, uh, interesting topic of introduction to material subroutine in abacus by uh, Naushad, dr Naushad. and then we will uh, have regular uh, sessions and in the end we will have a valedictory function as well 
So and I we will come. Validity function, uh, Professor uh, Chamal may engage you for about half an hour, and I requested the uh, head of the department, uh, Professor Shiv Kumar, who talked to you yesterday, to join at eight thirty. So from eight thirty to nine, we'll have a brief session where we expect to hear from you uh, as feedback on uh, how you felt and uh, any ideas that you have with regard to. So some uh, follow-up uh, workshop that we plan to have in uh, in June. Uh, Professor Chamal is likely to come uh, to come to India at that time. Uh, we may have we originally planned to have two uh, two levels of uh, offline interaction, one at Chennai and one at Jamshedpur, uh, even this time, but that could not happen because of this uh, you know Omicron. So we may do that in uh, June. So if we if we want to do an offline interaction in June, everything is a follow up workshop. You have, if you have any ideas of how we should uh, structure it or any topics that you want to be focused on, you can give us some ideas tomorrow. Uh, so please uh, participate in the validatory function and uh, give us uh, good feedback uh, orally. Perhaps we can even circulate a small uh, Google uh, form. feedback Google form where you can also write some of these things uh, verbally. Okay. Okay. Thank you all.